Chapter 11, El Paso, Texas Samuel stopped telling his story to young Cush and just sat there in deep thought. Dan Daddy? Dan Daddy! Samuel heard his small voice calling out his name. Cush looked up at him. Why are you crying, Dan Daddy? Samuel got up and started looking for some papers. Here it is. As he returned and sat down. Prophetess Akila Malik wrote these papers centuries ago, and she said it best. The war for the soul of humanity and planet Earth is real and unrelenting, the hardest to win when the souls for whom you fight are loyal allies of the enemy you face. You are, in effect, fighting a war on two fronts. Worst of all, trying to save someone who doesn't know they are in danger, refuses to believe it when you tell them, and refuses to accept it even after they've seen the proof. That is the mindset of most of those we've encountered for some time now since returning to Louisiana, along with the very isms. Sexism, men thinking they are superior to women. Racism, whites and other people of color thinking they are superior to black. People or others of different shades than themselves. Classism, one group thinking they are superior to another because of what they possess or who they think they are in elitism. Those who think they are the apex and everyone else is the base. The saddest and most frustrating of all is dealing with the truth, you know, blatant and irrefutable, that none of this is anything more than an illusion created by the very enemy you fight. And you are fighting to pull people out of a burning house while they insist the enemy who fans the flames will save them. One definition of hell is the truth seen too late. Turning a few pages, Samuel said, Here's another one I like by her. It would be nice if my people were as quick to notice the truth as they are of birthday wishes or photos of cute babies. When the Torah says, My people perish for lack of knowledge. It is true. But they also perish because they choose to ignore knowledge when it is given. As Moses said, The people ate, drank, and rose up to play. Because it was easier than facing the truth, Dr. Richard King, scholar, once warned that the perpetual war against black people was never-ending and would continue until we create systems for fighting back. For decades since the end of the Civil War, police and the prison system have been used to control the existence and freedom of the former black slaves and their descendants. The police were originally formed, evolving out of the posse to track down runaway slaves and later to protect whites. Terrified of retaliation following the emancipation they were at first paid bodyguards. Then they evolved into community patrols and into the municipal guardians they are today. It was never intended that black men should be among them since they were formed to regulate and control that very group. Statistics don't lie. As Dr. Richard King eloquently pointed out, this war is about revenge, retaliation, and retained control of a community all but a few moral whites and sub-whites believe should have total equality and freedom. We, who are the young resistors of the civil rights era, tried to warn the elders of the day that unless and until we, like our Native American brothers and sisters, demanded our own free and independent nation within a nation, with all the rights and benefits we were thereto entitled, we would never know true freedom. As I said in a speech I once gave to political candidates, Freedom ain't free. They let us go, but kept our freedom hostage. The aim is to curtail and reduce our population by reducing and controlling the black male, seen as the greatest threat to white supremacy power and key to reproduction. The statistics speak for themselves. Recognizing this is one thing, changing it is another. Wiping the tears from his eyes, Samuel said, Sorry, son, just thinking about our people who have died from these STDs that have plagued the land, and I was thinking about them. Anyway, son, that's enough for today. I'm tired. Trying to change the subject, Kush asked. How do you talk to animals, Dan Daddy? Samuel, seeing the concern on Kush's face, smiled. Um, that's a hard one to explain. It's more telepathically, um, but not really. I have to think about how to explain that one and get back to you on that one. When you have been doing something so long, it's just hard to explain it. Samuel looked at Cush. Son, it's getting late. Come on back tomorrow. Gone on before it gets any darker. 
The truth was Samuel was still emotionally upset and didn't want to continue his story, but Cush was not sleepy and started asking Samuel more questions about his story. Dan Daddy, whatever happened to Uday when he went to Lake Providence? Samuel smiled and pointed at Cliff and Ron, sleeping on a couch across from them. Those are his descendants right there. Surrounding them were dishes and towels from the meals that Big Ma had bought them throughout the day as he told Cush his story. Clean up this mess, take the dishes to the sink, and go on home. Tell your mother to send you over here after you have done your chores tomorrow. Cush was hesitant. Honestly, Dan Daddy, after that story about those demons, I'm afraid to sleep tonight. Samuel stood up and stretched. Do you know the Lord's Prayer? Cush quickly said. Yes, Dan Daddy. Samuel looked at Cush. Okay then, say that, and you will sleep just nicely. Samuel walked toward the kitchen and abruptly stopped. Listen, son, we are in a time and age where people say you have to say fifty Hail Marys or do this or do that for the Lord to hear you. I say just become a friend to your Creator and let Him guide you. You see, everyone's friendship is different. Become His friend, you respect your friends. Here on earth, respect Him as if He is your friend. You know He doesn't like this or that. Don't do this or that and learn his way like any other friend, and he'll guide you on the right path. I have a friend who cannot stand cigar smoke, so I do not smoke around him. That is respect, that's a friend. Kush still didn't want to go home and had heard many people say, Don't ask that man about no poetry, he's good, but he'll wear you out. So he said, Dan Daddy, I heard you write poetry too. Samuel was determined to send Kush on his way but he knew he was still bothered about the story of Incubus and Succubus, so Samuel turned around and took a seat in his chair. It runs in the family. Okay, I'll tell you a few, and then you'll have to go. Hum, I wrote this one thinking about how it used to be in the olden days. Clearing his throat, he said. Perfect world. Grandfather smoking like a train as he grasps for air to breathe. Mother is cursing. Father ducking from the things thrown in the air. Sons and daughters are growing up so fast, saying, Life isn't fair. Grandmother fussing because the nutrients are missing. No food in the house, nothing is in the kitchen, everyone screaming. This living is unfair. This country is singing like birds, with words of foolishness and pride. Foolishness and pride that we despise. City rushing like ants on a hill, as she prepares for war. Drugs dancing as it captures their prisoners, returning them to jail. Schools praying, for they know it is they who are sending us to hell. But who cares? Jobs dying as they try to reach the unreachable. Money crying out for its cousin's greed and pride that can be seen even in your eyes. Husband sinking because he is unable to pay his rent. Preacher crying, for they have no more stories to tell. Grass waving like little children as they wait patiently to speak to the sun for growth, or even the moon to sleep. Dog barking like selfish women. Who can have their way? Fleas biting as they work their nine to five, to survive, all this jive, while sitting on their prey. Diseases lurking in the darkness, is all this making you blue? It's happening because of you. As death waiting patiently for the moment to grab you, taking you to its home, your final resting place. Grown men yelling like little girls, as we all try to live in this perfect world. Samuel said, I like this one too. Signs of the times. I asked so many questions, not one could be answered. I had to learn them on my own. Why didn't anyone know the answer to my questions? Were they so hard? Had to realize some of them alone, on my own. Searched and searched. Still, No one could answer these questions except him. Who knows everything? Goodness and mercy is his name. Asked about hunger, pain, and suffering. Asked about mankind and prejudice. Envy and hatred. Explain. How we all go through all these things today. While other things get in the way. Generations, getting worse than the one before. Those that were not strong, but humble. Will make it past the test, the test of time. Telling me, it would soon be over. It would no longer exist. 
Telling me, it was going to get worse. Before it gets better. Telling me, it was all written, in the signs of the times. Samuel finally sent Cush home, but bright and early, Samuel saw Cush outside staring at Gemini as if he were trying to speak to him. Cush stood there for ten minutes before he continued on to Samuel's house. As he knocked on the door, Samuel said, Come on in, Cush. Cush walked into the house. Samuel curiously asked, Well, I see you were trying to talk to old Gemini. Did you get anywhere? Cush said out of frustration. No. Samuel smiled. Just keep trying. One day, we'll go out there and try it together. They talked for a while, and Big Ma made them a big breakfast as usual, and then the two of them headed to his study. Samuel took a sip of coffee. Sabbath had to deal with us first, before he went on to everyone else. There was a reason for that, but first I must say. Humans started the separation of color, religion, and damn near everything else because of one word, jealousy. You don't hate someone because they are smarter than you. Do you? Cush said. Nah. Samuel asked. How about taller than you? Cush gave a funny look. No. I look at hatred the same way and it's the silliest thing man ever did. But Sabbath made that clear. But we'll get to that in a bit. Taking another sip of coffee. Well now, Wanyanyekava meeting Incubus and Succubus is where we left off, but let's fast forward a bit. He was in Tallulah for three months and learned a lot about his family, and some important things that would prepare him emotionally for his trip to Arizona. Samuel paused for a second, well, after he left Tallulah, he traveled alone for four more months or so. Many days were delightful and encouraging, some very hard and rigorous, but Wanyanyekovu was transforming into the man that Sabaoth wanted him to be. Traveling by foot by day, resting at night to avoid heavily populated areas and men altogether, for the time being, because Mletsi told him it was not the time. But he was learning a deeper understanding of each component of man's totality. He saw the difference between the traditions of man and spirituality. He got close to three metro areas along the way that would last from three to six months, whereby each major stop intensified the training. One site was just a few miles north of the metro, Shreveport, Louisiana. Then he headed southwest near Metro Dallas. Then, he headed to the abandoned cities of Ardmore and on to Abilene, Texas. Once in Abilene, Wanyanyekova finds himself in a thick wooden forest. After training, as he headed west, he noticed the animals walking alongside him as if they knew him. The scenery started changing as he watched two squirrels slowly chase each other. With his attention focused on the squirrels, he suddenly turns and sees he's in the midst of the desert, seeing a rattlesnake slither right by him. Confused about what just happened, he stopped and said to himself, What is this? Deja vu? Letsy appeared before him. Wanyanyekova said, I'm confused. I don't know the differences between reality and my dreams. I was just in a wooded area, and now I'm suddenly in the desert. But I didn't see what was in front of me, but rather a dream I had many months ago. Letsy said to him in a calm voice, Turn around. You'll see you have walked at least a mile in the desert. Here, the environment you are used to has abruptly ended, and it will be a while before you return to it. You were indeed somewhere else, from when you left our last location, until now. I hoped you could find that place, and know the differences between the two. I need you to concentrate and learn this for a reason. Sabaoth has been dealing with you with this since you left home. Introducing it to you in dreams that now have come to pass, and it's growing stronger for a reason. I will explain later as you learn that difference. Now, continue to travel west. I will return with a blessing from Sabaoth when you have achieved this final lesson. Waninyekova said, I don't understand it at all. Letsy said, You will. And Waninyekova rubbed his eyes, scratched his head, then replied with determination. It is so. Unfamiliar with this environment, he didn't know what to eat or where to find water. He ran across a plant and what appeared to be some kind of fruit on it. He took a bite of it and found himself getting sick. Then, he woke up and still had the fruit in his hand, but it hadn't been bitten, 
so he immediately threw it away. The confusion would come and go, and he thought he was going crazy for a moment. He dropped to his knees as he prayed. Sabbath, I don't know what I'm doing. Please guide me. As he was praying, Sabaoth showed him a cactus, and the things he read as a child manifested. Water from cactus and snakes. I shall eat. These bizarre dreams continued to happen to him until he began to get used to them, but his diet remained the same for thirty days until he found himself in Socorro, Texas, outside El Paso. Letsy appeared before him, saying, Your trials are finished, and you have accomplished all that Sabaoth has required of you. Anointing one in Yekavu's forehead, Letsy continued, Release your spirit, open your mind, and your flesh shall follow. Every spirit has a gift, but the flesh and the mind prevent its manifestation. Each gift is unique for everyone, for gifts are freely given to all flesh. That Sabaoth creates. Your Creator chose you because of your heart and humbleness. There will only be three people in this lifetime who shall receive this gift. It shall soon come to you like breathing, and you must embrace it. For it is a special gift from Sabaoth. You are the first of humanity ever to receive such a gift, and you shall teach every man how to embrace his gift. With this special gift, you shall pass it on to your descendant when the time comes. Your gift as a man is a gift to see the heart for what it is, sincere or not. But that gift you received from Sabbath shall be as you have read in the books of kings during your holy jeûne, so shall you bless your descendant with a double portion of the blessing as Elijah did. Close your eyes and tell me what you see. One in Yekavu quickly replied, Darkness. Before he could finish the word, he said, Wait. I see me alone in the desert, and you are not here. Letsy said, Before you opened your eyes, I will not be here because your journey from here is your own now, and you will only see me again when Sabbath needs you to see me. Your special gift from Sabbath is to see ten minutes into the future, but you need to accept it and control it. Everyone doesn't need to know your gift, which you will learn. Your true journey starts now. One in Yekavu opened his eyes, and Letsy was gone. The evening sun faded as he sat there gazing into the sky. He noticed a hare just within range for a quick dinner as the sun set. He reached for his bow, shot the hare, prepared a small fire, and cleaned it. As he waited for the hare to get to that perfect brown tone, he seasoned it with some of the last fresh herbs and spices he received from his mother. He just stood there looking into the fire, grabbing a pen and pad, and wrote, Black Race. Contemplating. Yes, heavy thoughts run throughout this weary mind. Sad thoughts, happy thoughts. But how do I express myself to you? Ungrateful is a word I like to use. It seems hard to say, but it's the truth that will lead you to the straight and narrow way. Disrespectfulness seems to be second nature for you. Why do I try so hard to be so polite in my sayings? Cause with humility and kindness, you get the best results. Nothing will happen without the two. If people don't listen to you, it will be your fault? What kind of nonsense is that? I speak, and you take what you want. All I ask is, do your own research. I do not lie, it's the best of my knowledge. Here I go, face to face. By the way, I dedicate this to the black race. Firstly, to the males who make up 70% of those who are in jail. Be strong. For the sisters, who have forgotten about true love. Know when you are wrong. And I say this in every aspect of life. If you need an example, look at Jesus Christ. He paid the price. The supreme sacrifice. The abusive nature that we are now in has created so much confusion between us. Within us. Creating something that the black race has never seen before. Killing for land that's not ours. Killing each other for the colors we wear. Killing one another because of a simple stare. Brothers rejecting the natural course of a man. Even sisters are doing the same. Receiving within themselves that which is unnatural and uncommon. What a silly and lame game that we play. Talking to the black race. To those who don't understand, let me offer you a hand. Homosexuality is what I refer to. At first, when I saw it, it was something I feared to see. 
I thought it could rub off on me. Ignorant to the sickness, but now it's clear. No more do I reject my brothers and sisters because of their sexuality. Many have been used, abused, and now. Confused. Unable to deal with these problems, they have left their true origin, their roles in life. But as long as they need me, I will always be there for them to see. Because they are my people, the black race. There are some amongst you, I've heard you say. He is from the south, but I'm from the north. She is from the West Indies, but I'm from Europe, and that saddens me. Are you trying to say? I am dumb and you're smart? Hell, where's your damn heart? Where are your eyes? We're still black. Teach me what you know, and I'll teach you what I know. Let's stop being each other's foes. Someone who holds the truth, but never tells that truth is of no use. How can you be useful to anyone but you? Knowledge that isn't shared that makes me blue. Suicide wasn't our way of dealing with our problems. We were always able to handle them, even solve them. Once proud people to be called the black race. Now to many, it's a disgrace. Jumping off bridges. Putting guns to our heads. Our precious. Gift of life flows through the streets until we are dead. Rats lick this blood, as if it's wine, this must be a part of the end times. From Babylon to Uncle Tom's. Field niggers to house niggers. From jail to prison. Is our existence a sin? To the sisters, I won't say much, because I believe a lot of what's wrong with you is us. Slave mentality still runs rampant in our hearts and minds. Jealousy and envy is helping to destroy our kind, our minds. Can you be happy with anyone? They live in a nice house? Or drive a fine car? What a shame, we're still playing the killing game. A people that has been through so much hell. We should be the nicest people on this planet. Killing and hurting is all we know. So, it seems to be the only thing we do. Laugh and criticize those who have a dream. Don't have respect for our mothers. The black race seems to be a disgrace to the human race. Come out of the person you've been molded to be. Forget what's in your minds about each other. Learn to be lovers of yourself. Then you can be lovers to others. When that happens, you will no longer be called a race that doesn't exist. For where is the land of black? Until. You realize that you will forever be an outcast. The lowest form of life. You see others know their point of origin. Koreans, Japanese, Europeans, Italians. All recognize their race, their place. But your title will be plain and simple. The black race. One Yenyekova was staring at the fire, waiting for his meal to finish, when he smelled something strange. Looking up, he saw his meal burning. After a few minutes of cleaning off the burnt sections, he slowly ate his meal and laid down for the night. He had a vision of a few men just a few yards away from him as he was lying down. He focused on the men and their conversation. Ace Lin, one man said to another, No disrespect but your father would have my head if we don't return soon, said Margier, a tall and skinny young man about eighteen years old whose job was to look after Ace Lin, the young son of a tyrant named Oedipus. They stood looking at Wanyanyekovu, writing in his notepad from a distance with three of his bodyguards, Adalbert, Alwyn, and Corin. I'll have Corin take your head now, if you don't be quiet, said Ace Lin. I am hungry now, and this cat tea has dinner already ready. We're going to kill him and take his fucking food. Aislin was eighteen years old, tall, hard-faced, and a very spoiled young man. They all had no choice but to agree. Follow my lead, then, Adalbert said. One in Yekovis sees and hears these five Anakata's men gather behind a large brush in the desert. After ten minutes he hears, Evening, my friend, we mean no harm. We're heading toward El Paso, and thought that you might be on your way as well, and maybe you might need some company, Adalbert said. Wanyanyekova smiled because he knew these were the same men he saw in his vision. Wanyanyekova was always a serious young man and hardly joked or played around at all. You would have had to have known him for quite some time for him to make a joke around you. 
They didn't know that his weapon of choice was the white cane passed down from his ancestors, which yielded the samurai sword inside it when you turn it a particular way. Made from elephant tusk, his great-grandfather had killed years ago. They didn't know that his bow was another weapon he loved for distances, which his grandfather made for his father, and his father gave it to him for his journey. But his love for carving wood and fashioning different. Metals made him an expert in throwing stars and knives. What they didn't know was about to be the last thing they knew. For one Yanyekova said to the men, How is it that so many come for one man? Is this the way of the Anakatas? No, I have not known of this way since hunting for boar. As a child, we did go in groups to hunt the great beasts, for they are dangerous animals when you come face to face. So, is this what you see when you see me? A great animal, and you are children looking for a great adventure? Corin was Asselin's chief bodyguard, twenty-two year old, six foot two inches, weighing two hundred and sixty pounds, with muscles bulging out of his clothing. He snarled popping his neck and shaking his shoulders. Leave this little man to me, and let me show him what I do to boars. Pausing to finish popping his neck, he said, Let's play little man. One Yanyekova noticed that Corin came rushing in, so he sidestepped to his right and Neil kicked him to the stomach. Then, he spun around and kneed him in the head, followed by a roundhouse kick. Is that the best you can do? One Yanyekova shouted, pointing at Corin who was knocked out cold. Seeing this, the other four men yelled as they rushed toward Wanyan Yekavu. He side-kicked Adalbert in the throat as he gasped for air. He took out his cane and quickly struck him in the temple, instantly killing him. As he swung around, he crossed the other bodyguard, Alwyn, in the groin. As Alwyn was leaning forward, he mule kicked Margier. With one swift move, he turned the handle of his cane, revealing the samurai's blade taking out Alwyn by piercing his heart as he pivoted just enough to decapitate Margier as he was leaning forward. Aislin, the tyrant's son, fearing for his life, ran into the darkness. Listening to his footsteps as he ran, Wanyanyekvi threw a star that landed deep in the back of his skull, killing him. Anger comes over him as he hears the moans of Corin. He quickly drives his samurai into his heart, turning it 180 degrees. He took his samurai and slashed it in the air, forcing the blood from the blade. With one swift move, he wipes it with a cloth as it collapses back into the cane. As he heard the locking mechanism click, he looked for a minute at the dead men. The entire fight had already played out in his mind, but he had to play his part. Wanyanyekova knew every move they would make before they made them. Amazed at seeing things before they happened, he learned how to let different scenarios play out in his head, as he was not much for playing games. But Wanyanyekovu always hated violence and was saddened, but he saw what they would do to him and realized it was him or them. But the sight of blood, which he considers the soul's essence, still saddened him as he stood there. He threw up his entire meal. He quickly packs up his belongings and heads toward Metro El Paso, Texas. Seeing the images of the men's faces and the blood on his clothing, he dropped to his knees in disgrace and shouted, Sabaoth, please forgive me for I have shed blood, and I have killed, not one, but five more of your creations in one night. It seemed like hours as Wanyan Yekavu cried out to Sabaoth before he finally fell asleep. As he closes his eyes and sees darkness, he sees a small light above his head. The light gets larger and more prominent, then suddenly, he sees his grandmother. It's a boy, she shouts for joy. His family surrounded him, for it is his birth that he is witnessing. One Yanyekova then sees his entire life. It was as if he relived every second until the exact time he fell asleep. The darkness covered him again, and then he heard a great voice. Before you were in the womb, I called thee. Waking up to that great voice, one Yanyekova arose from his sleep and wiped the tears from his eyes. It is so. The sun rose. Wanyanyekova smiled, for joy had covered him, but the pain still overshadowed him. Three hours had passed filled with these mixed emotions as he arrived one mile south of the opening into El Paso Metro. The first metro he had ever seen in his life, up close at least, there were only ten metro and 
hundreds if not thousands of micros that he knew of, and only three metros were down South Dallas, Houston, and Atlanta. El Paso was no longer considered the South, but its metro was a gigantic bubble about 24 miles high and a perimeter of 52 miles wide. He had heard about metro and micros from others in his village, books in the library, but he had never seen them for himself. He stood there in awe for five minutes. The bubble, as it is called back home, stood there like a transparent, crystallized liquid that seemed to fall like a waterfall but was forced to stay in place with a never-ending cycle of lava-like fluid. He stood there looking through the bubble afar to see the sky, large buildings, and thousands of sky craft racing throughout the bubble. He was in awe of the floating building that stood amid the atmosphere.